get started. Well, folks, before I launch into this presentation, I need to make a disclaimer. And that disclaimer is this. Uh, today, I'm doing a lecture that I would describe not as a feel-good lecture. And those aren't the type of lectures I like to do. I want to warn you up front that I'm going to be speaking really openly and very frankly about uh, some aspects of the food production system. One of the things that uh, I worry about when I give these type of lectures is the fact that speaking about diet is sometimes a lot like speaking about politics and religion. It's one of those taboos that you don't go there. So I'm hoping I can launch into this talk and not tread too firmly on anybody's beliefs or views. Does that make sense? Cool? All right. Now you're a small group today, so you're gonna have to really speak up once we get going. <laughs> All right. This is a picture of a Western native and I want you to notice the tools that she's using uh, as she collects seeds from this shrub that you see in front of her. One of the great things about Aboriginal or traditional peoples is that their food defined them as a people. It's not only embedded in their belief systems, in their songs, in their rituals, but even the specific tools that they use to harvest food. And it, of course, it changes no matter where you go, depending on what it is that they're gathering. And we refer to this whole suite of skills that they have as their traditional ecological knowledge and wisdom. Here you'll notice there's a Yosemite native who's demonstrating processing of acorns. And, and look at the different shapes of the baskets that she has. Right? All of these fulfill a specific function, and these are a set of skills that are passed on through the generations to make sure that each coming generation can acquire the nutrition that they need from the landscape. One of the things that happens uh, quite frequently in these Aboriginal cultures is they consume foods that now we might think of as not very appealing. Things like dried dried whitefish eggs, as well if you look at the tomcod there that was collected by the Anupiat natives of northwestern Alaska, and you notice the row cut to hang out so that it can dry as well. And if you ask people, in this case, the Anupia, why were you consuming the fish eggs, the answer, no matter what culture you speak to, is always the same. And it was for this. It was so that they could have healthy children. It was of prime importance to hunter-gatherer societies because they were the people who would take care of the elderly. They were the people who would be making the next decisions within the communities, etc. What we run into today is that truly healthy children are actually becoming rare. And I'm going to give you some statistics to support that. I'm not just going to say that they're unhealthy. I'm going to document that. And in fact, many of us in this room are sitting here with facial deformities that we don't even recognize are the result of poor nutrition prior to and during the pregnancy of our mothers. And to really sort of go back and to get you to understand where our nutrition has fallen short, I have to talk about the New England landscape, the main landscape, and get you to realize that this is the natural state of most of our uplands in this part of the world. It's a forest. That's what happens, of course, once the fields grow up, once the burned areas grow up, we would end up with something that looks like this, a closed canopy forest. Here's where I need you to get involved. This is obviously a clear cut, uh, a rather large one, and I'm sort of curious to hear what is your first thought that comes to mind when you look at this image. Keep it simple, but shout it out. North Main Woods. North Main Woods. I want an emotion. Good, bad, glad, scared. What do you feel when you look at this image? Death. Death. Anybody else? There's no wrong answer. Scared? All right. And so if I show you another, another image of a clear cut with all the slash left behind, is it fair to say that no one has a good feeling in their stomach? Despite any argument that can be made to the necessity of this practice, if such an argument can be made, you still don't have a good feeling in your stomach. Is that fair? Okay. And what about this image? Again, same question. What do you feel right here? What's that? Disgust. Disgust. Anybody else? 
<laughs> Vulnerability. I, I lose my appetite, but that's, that's a little bit of pride. Vulnerability. Vulnerability. I feel a little bit of pride. Yes. <laughs> that makes sense where it comes from, Jeff. Now, I'm going to show you the picturesque small family farm in the Northeast. That's what I've tried to capture a picture of here. And I want, again, shout out what feeling comes to mind. Peace. Peace? Nostalgia. Nostalgia. Splendor, Jeff? I'd say colonialism. Colonialism. Most of what I heard certainly doesn't resonate as extremely negative. In other words, this gives us a better, a better feeling. Is that fair than the preceding images? Okay. Well, here's, here's what I want to get you to think of. This farm, which I'll argue, just like many other farms around this country, are certainly necessary for us to be able to supply calories to our large population that we have on this continent. But I want to talk about the potential negative aspects of even the small-scale organic family farm that many people would consider to be an ideal way of interacting with the landscape. This is an aerial view of the small-scale family farm. And what I want you to realize is that that farm is still a clear-cut. You can see that, everyone, in the picture here? Now, it may be a smaller clear-cut than a large agribusiness farm, but nonetheless, it's still a clear-cut. And what's more important is that clear-cut doesn't have an opportunity to grow back, right? It gets kept in a permanent clear-cut state and planted with non-native species. Corn, squash, pumpkin, and things of that like are not things that are native to this part of the world they were brought here. This is a really nice image that sort of gets you to understand the difference between agriculture and permaculture. What I want you to look at is imagine this open plain that you see here. In fact, if we go over to the bare soil, and that could have happened after a fire, after a landslide, after some erosion event, or after people have come in and cleared the landscape. And succession talks about, of course, a suite of plants that come in that colonize a site and gradually give way as different species occupy that site that can handle more shade or different aspects of the soil as the plants have lived there for some time until ultimately in this part of the world that we would have a closed canopy forest again until some catastrophe, some natural catastrophe comes along to again remove that canopy and give us an open site. Now, not to speak too harshly, but it's very accurate to say that agriculture, it represents a permanent catastrophe on the landscape by maintaining it as open in this part of the world. How many people here are, um, are involved in family farms or small-scale farming? So we have some people. How much plastic is used in the farms that you work with? Some, none, little. Yeah, it, it, lots it, of row cover, more row cover than plastic. Yeah, yeah. It, it was it was really surprising to me to learn how much is used, particularly in the Northeast, where a lot of plastic is used to give seedlings a head start and keep them protected. But I want to again stress that this is this is not an ideal way of interacting with our landscape because of what happens to plastic. Ultimately, it has to go somewhere. And one of the things that you need to remember, there's 200 million tons of plastic produced around the world. That's a lot. 26 million tons each year right here in the U.S. And we only recycle 5 to 8 percent of it. So it's a tiny little amount. 7 billion plastic bags go into landfills each year. And if you weren't aware, and I've only recently become aware, that when you burn plastic, whether that's medical or otherwise, in incinerators, one of the unintentional byproducts is dioxin. And if you're aware, that's one of the most horrible pollutants that we have here on the main landscape that even stops us from being able to consume fish out of our rivers. How about this? What are these guys? Earthworms. Earthworms. Good, bad, indifferent? Wonderful. Tasty. Wonderful. <laughs> Just so that you're aware, earthworms are not native to anywhere in the Northeast. In fact, of the glaciated regions of the U.S., 
were earthworm free until they were brought here both intentionally and unintentionally in the soil for various plants that have been shipped here from Europe and other places. If I show, how many people know or, know or have heard of the plant purple loose strife? You're aware of that and you're aware that this is a real, very invasive plant that is colonizing wetlands um, here in the, in the east. And though it has many good features, it also very much changes the character of those wetlands. And that's the same is true of earthworms. They represent an invasion of a non-native species, but under the ground so that you don't see it. Forests around the East Coast, particularly those that have deciduous trees, should have a thick layer of duff over them like you see here each fall where the leaves fall and land on the ground. But I want you to notice this photo. This is freshly falling leaves in the fall. I want you to notice they're landing on almost bare mineral soil. And this is something that I've seen in both New York and Pennsylvania. And this is the result of earthworms. They speed the decomposition of the litter. So we're losing that protective layer of duff sitting on the ground under the forest. That's super important for a host of species, including this one. What's this?